Yes, it's that magical time again where we take a look at some of the interesting concept aircraft that have been designed over the years, and oh boy, today do we have a doozy. This weaponized frisbee, let's call it, is often known as the Silver Bug, which was designed by John Frost, a talented engineer who spent many years working with Avro Canada, mainly to try and design a revolutionary new VTOL aircraft. This is a deeply interesting topic, which will get its own in-depth video in the future, as it actually led to a physical flying saucer that technically flew, the Avro car, but today we're just looking at the Silver Bug concept. Other projects soon took over that involved Avro Canada, the US Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and even various intelligence branches, but this was the progenitor that led to the rest. Now this topic takes us back to 1953. At this point, John Frost had been heading up Avro Canada's Special Projects Group, or SPG, for a number of years. Some of his time had been spent working on the CF-100 fighter, which will get its own video as well, but his true passion had been in Project Y. This saw the development of advanced VTOL designs, which were focused around a new radial flow gas turbine, the origins of which could be traced back to research conducted by BMW during the Second World War. Project Y had resulted in the design of an aircraft that looked somewhat like a giant spade. A mock-up had been produced, and it has even been suggested that early static engine tests had also been carried out, though I couldn't find enough source material to completely confirm this. But by this point in time, Frost was trying to move on to something better. He felt that the current design of the Y2 program was inefficient, and he began drawing up plans for a fully circular disc-like aircraft instead. This would make use of the Coanda effect, which describes the tendency of a fluid jet to stay attached to a convex surface. A good example of this is something you might have seen back in school, where you had a ping pong ball suspended in a current of air directed by a thin tube. Frost's idea was to build a flying disc using the radial flow engine, and making use of the Coanda effect, some of the exhaust gases would be ducted over the disc's leading edge to produce lift. This, combined with thrust produced by other ducted vents in the disc's lower half, would allow it to take off from a lying flat position. This is something that the current Project Y could not do, and it could only take off vertically as a tail sitter. Unfortunately, Frost was struggling to secure additional funding for his new idea. Project Y was already horribly over budget, and the Canadian government was beginning to turn its eyes to other more conventional aircraft designs instead. But then came along a saviour in the US Air Force. A group of US Air Force officials had paid a visit to Avro Canada to inspect the new CF-100 fighter. During this visit, Frost took advantage of his senior position and steered them towards his own development area, where he then showed them the current Project Y and his plans for the improved flying disc, some of which had not even been viewed by his own superiors at Avro Canada. The US Air Force took immediate interest in Frost's work and after some subtle manoeuvring, where they may or may not have accidentally leaked various things to the public, which caused something of a financial scandal for Avro Canada, they all but took over Frost's SPG, provided him with full funding, and connected him with various research departments within the Air Force, MIT, NACA, soon to become NASA, and several others. The result of this would be Project 9961, and this led to two disc-shaped aircraft designs that became known as the Silver Bugs. The first Silver Bug was a small, one-man subsonic VTOL research aircraft, which had a diameter of just 21 feet and 6 inches, or around 6.5 meters. It was to be powered not by the new radial flow gas turbine, but by eight Armstrong Siddeley Vipers, which were axial flow turbojets, which were arranged like spokes on a wheel and would draw air from inlets around the aircraft's centre and duct the exhaust over the edge of the disc. 
This would be used to refine the aerodynamics of the design, and to essentially act as a mini prototype for the second silver bug. The cockpit was located at the centre and covered by a single piece bubble canopy. As one would expect, being sat in the centre of a giant disc didn't exactly provide the best visibility for either takeoff or landing, and to try and get around this major problem, a reinforced glass panel was to be installed in the floor of the cockpit. Though it was designed without any form of landing gear, it would be later suggested that a series of small retractable legs be installed to both make landing safer, and to prevent damage to the underside of the aircraft. Unlike the small test aircraft, the second Silverbug was much larger, and far more ambitious. It boasted a larger span of just under 30 feet, and it did make use of the highly advanced radial flow gas turbine. This engine was being developed by Orenda Engines, which was under Avro Canada's Jet Propulsion Division. Control of the aircraft would have been achieved by the selective direction of exhaust gases over different parts of the disc's airframe, to generate different angles of lift. Pitch and roll was regulated by angular nozzles above and below the disc, and your control was handled by the redirection of exhaust gases at the disc's rear. Depending on the mode of flight, air intake for the radial engine would be handled differently. For VTOL operations, and when the aircraft was on the ground, it would draw air through upper central inlets on the upper end of the disc. And for conventional flight, it would use a combination of front-facing and lower inlets. On paper, the design promised astonishing performance. It was projected to have a top speed of Mark 3.7, and a service ceiling of at least 90,000 feet, and it was expected to have a climb to 70,000 feet of just 4 minutes. But the compact design allowed little room for fuel tanks, meaning it would have a range of little more than 600 miles, which was quite pitiful, and quite early on, the US Air Force began to have doubts about the feasibility of the radial flow gas turbine. Not only was it massively complex, and becoming massively expensive to develop, but it would be also incredibly susceptible to battle damage. Now, if the flying disc lost engine power, it would lose all form of control. This would not only make emergency landings impossible, but in most cases it would prove impossible for the pilot to safely eject. Because of this, Frost and his design team would be instructed to take the radial arranged engines of the first Silverbug design and apply it to the latter. Now, while this instruction was given, it is unclear as to how far into the Silverbug project any changes were made, as by the time they were making the switch from the radial flow engine to the radial arranged engines, Various other projects had been initiated, and the Silver Bugs were essentially being replaced by projects for both the US Navy, the US Army, the US Air Force, and also projects within Avro Canada itself. So, as far as the engine layout goes for the Silver Bug design, it gets a little bit complicated, and what we will do for the time being is simply put it aside until we get to the long video which discusses the development of these designs in detail. Now, engine complications aside, this second Silverbug was designed for the Air Force as a combat aircraft, primarily as an interceptor, and there were several suggestions on how such a unique design might be armed. One idea, which actually received an alarming amount of attention, owing to the poor reliability of early missile systems, and questions of where they would store either cannons or said missiles, was to heavily armour the front leading edge of the disc, and simply use the silver bug to ram Soviet nuclear bombers at speeds in excess of 2,000 miles an hour. Supposedly, the combination of the bug's shape, its reinforced leading edge, and the extreme speeds of impact meant that there would be little risk posed to the pilot, apparently but I could not imagine a pilot willingly climbing themselves into such a design if they knew that their mission profile involved ramming an aircraft at more than twice the speed of sound. Now, while the anti-Soviet frisbee of death was not the only iteration of the Silver Bug, it was the one that received the most consideration. 
And weirdly enough, this was because the ramming flying saucer concept was actually the most conservative of the designs proposed by Frost at this time. Other designs he drew up included a naval version, which would have treated us to the sight of submarine-launched flying saucers armed with armor-piercing bombs. And, continuing the trend of designing weapons best suited for a Tom Clancy novel, he also proposed a giant flying saucer, with a diameter of over 100 feet, which could apparently achieve Mark III at cruising altitudes of 65,000 feet, with a range of 15,000 miles. Intercontinental flying saucer fantasies aside, there was still a lot to be said for many of the theories that Frost had proposed, and interest continued within Canada, the US Air Force, the Army, and the Navy, and several other intelligence branches, including the CIA. This led to the development of several other design projects which sort of splintered off from the Silver Bucks, of which Frost played a major role. Now, many of these would not utilize the radial flow gas turbine, but instead now put a focus on ramjet technology, which was hoped to be more reliable. This would lead to things like Project 1794 and Weapon System 606A, neither of which would leave the drawing board, save for some static test beds, but it would lead to the development of a flying disc prototype, the Avro car. But that is a much longer story for another day. If you want to learn more about this particular topic, my recommended readings are as follows. There is Avrocar, Canada's Flying Saucer, the story of Avro Canada's Secret Projects by Bill Zook. And there is Secret Projects, Flying Saucer Aircraft by Bill Rose and Tony Butler. And there is also the final development summary report for Project 1794, which was declassified by the Air Force in the mid-1990s. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patreon supporters. This is the last video for the year as we bring 2023 to a close, and just as a heads up, part 2 of the French interwar bomber video won't be out until the second half of January, as I'm away at the start of the new year visiting my family, who I didn't get a chance to see over Christmas. Additionally, today's video was not actually meant to be planned as today's video, but I had to release this one earlier than expected, as the video that I had planned for today is being held up due to technical reasons, which I won't get into, but basically... I'm having a really bad string of luck when it comes to solid state drives right now, and let's just leave it at that. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a warm welcome to Ben Clayton, who is the newest member of this special group. Everyone's support over the past two and a bit years has been absolutely just staggering, and I can't put into words how much I appreciate it. But in the new year, I will do my level best to continue to be worthy of such excellent supporters, and I'm planning to bring some new and highly requested things to the channel in the next few months, which I'm really excited about. So, lots of good things to look forward to. But for now, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.